thank you for inviting me and Gautam for this. Uh, the sequence of the talk has changed, so now it will be unknowable and unstoppable. <clears throat> so uh, briefly, what I'll do is, uh, before I get into how their lives, uh, again, M. N. Roy's life overlapped and got intimate. Uh, I'll introduce Agge because many of you here might not have read Agge uh, or kind of known about him. Agge was uh, probably after Prem Chand, uh, the most important Hindi writer, father of his, called the father of uh, modernism, uh, Hindi modernism. And uh, unlike his contemporaries and even subsequent generation of Hindi writers, he had a very different background. He had a very cosmopolitan background, son of a noted archeologist and epigraphist Hiranan Sastri. He was born in an open field in uh, Kusinagar, Kasia, and father's job took him to all kinds of places, uh, Lucknow, Patna, Srinagar, and Utkaman. And there we find the Hindi writer, uh, he, he went to Madras Christian College, uh, where he studied science. Uh, and that's where his first interaction or his first experience of the caste system in South India, the Madras Christian College, the Brahmin and non-Brahmin hostel, all those things happened. And he, the entire, uh, he chose to leave Brahmin hostel and move to the non-Brahmin hostel. Uh, from there, he lands in uh, Lahore, Foreman Christian College, where he studied BSc, but series of where he wanted to be a physicist. He became a research assistant for Professor Bernard, who was a friend of Andrew Compton, who had got Nobel Prize sometime, I think, uh, in the 20, early 30s. No, uh, sometime in the 20s. And then he worked, he helped him with cosmic ray experiment, uh, traveled through him to many of these places in, in North India. But eventually, because of uh, illness, he couldn't do well in BSc, and that's the time he became, uh, he came in close contact with HSRA, the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association people. Bhagat Singh was already in jail, but Chansekhar Azad, Yaspal, and everyone else. Subsequently, we find he gets into, he's, he's involved in bomb making. His name in the group was Scientist. Uh, he was considered an expert bomb maker. He's, uh, he spends four years in jail. Uh, he comes out of jail. Uh, British government doesn't let him get out of Lahore with the help of C.F. Andrews and uh, Banarsi Das Chaturvedi. Actually, C.F. Andrews helps him come out there and he lands in um, Agra to do his first job. Uh, but against life is full of contradictions, ironies, so the man of the 1930s, the revolutionary of the 1930s, joins British army in 1940s, in this, during the Second World War. And that becomes one of the big seeking point. And Marxists never kind of forgive, uh, forgive him or forgot it. They kept reminding him till now, even now, despite a fat biography, they still think he was a collaborator and all that. Again, then again, in 1950s, gets involved with... Uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was started in Berlin. And uh, he, he's the key organizer of the uh, uh, first meeting, the second meeting, 1951 meeting, uh, in, which was first to be held in Delhi. Then uh, Nehru cancels it the last minute. Within 10 days, they shifted to Bombay. Minu Masani played a key role. But that was a brief association, uh, direct brief association of Agge with Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, because something happened, the allegation of $1,000 bungling on him, and he had to leave. And later on, this Office of Congress Cultural Freedom shifted to Bangalore, where Philip Spratt and others were part of it. Now, this uh, in between, this four years in jail, Agge also writes his famous uh, classic called Sekhar Alive, the first draft of which was mostly in English. And... Uh, by 52, and then after that, he writes his two volumes, which um, uh, is called Tar Saptak, which is uh, septet, uh, string septet, which is seven poets, mostly Marxists. Include, uh, he is also one of them. Uh, he's not a Marxist, but he's there, but most of the other poets were uh, Marxist. It's the first collection of uh, modern anthology, and which he 
काइंड ऑफ रिपीट्स आफ्टर एवरी फ्यू ईयर दूसरा सब तक तीसरा सब तक एंड चौथा सब तक ऑफकोर्स द क्वालिटी ऑफ तीसरा एंड चौथा इज नॉट मच टू टॉक अबाउट बट सो अगे द पैरल लाइफ ऑफ अगे विच एंड दैट्स वेयर एम एन रॉय कम्स टू हिज लाइफ इज ऑफ अ जर्नलिस्ट वेन ही कम्स और लाहौर ही he gets a job in agra in a paper called sanic it is a weekly paper run by congress it's considered a congress mouthpiece and the editor uh, krishnadath paliwal himself he, he also has political ambitions so he lets agra run the show and within few weeks if you see issues of uh, sanic it com- starts changing agra uh, by then is com- is convinced that fascism is on the rise and he's writing a lot on fascism under a new uh, he, he has a pseudonym called dr a latif subsequently he has another thing which many of you might uh, kind of understand it called kuti chatan which much later he had another uh, kind of monica called kuti chatan but here he's he wrote a lot on fascism and there is a a kind of a side of agave which is very little known is that he becomes a peasant leader for a brief time that takes him to merit he's in agra and he's interacting with lot of people so you have this uh, mathri sharan gupt who's a leading hindi poet uh, he's uh, going to merit where his uh, sister cousin is working in school and that's where he starts organizing peasants and we find that one of the first coup that within few months of joining sanic is getting mn roy to write for sanic and he runs a serialized piece called bharat ki punar jagriti you know this revival of india and where mn roy says that we we shouldn't be too caught up in our traditions it's a time for us to get in, to interact with the western world how agge and mn roy met most likely they were together in fajpur congress fajpur congress where nehru is says great things about mn roy he says a man with fresh ideas and fresh thoughts uh, subhash chandra bose says he has got a hello around his name but somehow gandhi never takes to him and gandhi calls him uh, tells him to rest and stay out of politics uh, and even tells even a very harsh comment he said that roy should render mute service to the cause of freedom and um, that's a uh, the time <clears throat> and and we also find that roys and agay's period of incarceration because when he's given the 12 year jail which is then commuted to 6 that's also the time when agay is in jail they meet most likely in mer when uh, after coming out of jail emin roy is traveling extensively through western up and that's when agay meets uh, emin roy he meets uh, sahajanand saraswati the big peasant leader from bihar and later uh, he gets him to uh, address a big meeting in uh, delhi uh, and agay brings his marches with peasants march takes takes place from merak to delhi nehru addresses that meeting although nehru tells them that look protest doesn't always mean it will lead to something immediate result but you should do it and but uh, so this kind of relationship and we find agay and agay's major influence political influence in fact he kept saying one of the last one of the longest interview he gave for duke university archives uh, where he says that only politician who influenced me was mn roy uh, if anyone i was very close to it was a radical humanist and so this relationship continue they write they are writing both of them are writing on almost similar topics uh, i think most likely it's at roy's behest that he introduces romer rollers two piece he translates them and he brings them uh, and he publishes them in sanic even in uh, M- mn roy uh, and both both of them again united in their dislike for gandhi so therefore when he introduces mn roy this is very interesting when his bharat ki punar jagriti piece starts he introduces them as his popular despite gandhi not liking him something like that you know this is so say then finally he, by 38 we find that agge has moved to this very iconic hindi journal from calcutta which continued for many many years called bishal bharat which was funded by which was run by uh, ramanand chatterjee who was hindu mahasabha 
but completely he lets his editors do whatever they want. Uh, so he had these three big journals, Pravashi in Bangla, uh, Vishal Bharat and Modern Review. So here he brings Semen Roy again. He not only brings Semen Roy, we find very young Lohia writing in Vishal Bharat. All these things are happening. Uh, and, and so wherever he goes, he takes them. But the biggest uh, uh, kind of achievement I find is that when Agge is asked to bring out a Gandhi issue, something which he's himself not very convinced about Gandhi. In fact, the only piece he ever wrote on Gandhi, which no one has seen, is private papers or nothing. He wrote in jail when Janendra Kumar told him that, look, uh, you have to kind of l know about Gandhi. So he says, okay, I'm trying. So there's this huge correspondence between them. He sends that article for Bisal Bharat from jail when it was being edited by uh, Banashi Das Chaturvedi. It never got published. Nobody saw all his private paper has that in 1970s, sometime in 1970s, that article Banarsi Das Chaturvedi returned. This is the longest rejection thing that I have heard in journalism. And he says, oh, it made a good reading, but still it's not part of the paper. Nobody knows, never got published. Uh, anyway, coming back to the Gandhi issue, he convinced M.N. Roy to write. And uh, he convinced three of uh, Gandhi baiters, Sajan and Saraswati, uh, two, uh, and Emin Roy to write. And Emin Roy said that Gandhi is basically, uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, he says that he played, uh, he says the passivity of poor people. No, this is, um, uh, he, he says he was, he was very critical of Gandhi's non-violence and he says Ahimsa, he argued, has limited Congress in such a way it could not use all means to achieve freedom. Sajan and Saraswati was another one who said that, you know, Gandhi, <coughs> Sajan and argued that religion plays a role in the passivity of poor people, which was also the basis of Gandhian political principles. Religion ought to remain the realm of spirituality and other worldly matters, not strain to politics. And he had got the whole galaxy of uh, Gandhi followers to a D.D. Kosambi wrote a long piece, uh, Polak wrote a long piece. Uh, this association by late 30s we find is turning very personal with uh, mm, Gandhi, with Agge and M.N. Roy. Uh, he, uh, Roy asked him to join the editorial board of what he was setting up then called Indian Renasha Limited. Ellen Roy even wanted him to buy sales. He couldn't, he, he never had money, but he asked a lot of his other friends to buy, but he was in the editorial board along with many others. Second World War, we find a big change in Agge's uh, life. Agge is probably the only one among the writers who says his writing is not enough. Fighting fascism through writing is not enough. And that's the only time we've also find he's differed with Emin Roy, who he thinks writes too much, doesn't do any action. But Roy, uh, Agge takes to, he joins British Army, not as some in a combat position or anything. He's posted in Northeast. He's giving daily reports about what people are feeling at the ground. And there he makes some few friends like Sidney Ball from Cambridge University. But Mazhar Ali Khan, father of Tariq Ali, who's also working with him, keeps away from, as he writes, from Agge, he says, because he's the M.N. Roy, he's very close to M.N. Roy, keep away from anyone who's very close to M.N. Roy. And they could never become friends, Mazhar Ali Khan and Agge. Finally, <clears throat> Uh, and then this relation, say, post-war, we find even during the war when he's uh, in uh, Northeast, he's in, mostly in Silong and other areas, uh, Roy is constantly making inquiries about Agge through his then lover, Kripa Sain, uh, asking him how is he, has he grown beard, you know, all kinds of things. And post-war, when he returns, uh, they... Uh, you know, they, uh, they again start a new venture with uh, M.N. Roy. It's called the India Library Project. The whole idea was that the India Library Project, along with his uh, uh, other association, uh, other thing which had already started, Indian Renaissance Limited, will uh, do translations of classics across Indian languages. Again, it doesn't happen. Many join this group. Uh, first time we see Philip Spratt is on board. Abu Sayyad, who later became a of Quest. So then, uh, by then we find he's spending a lot of time in Dehradun, where uh, Roy's lived. And 
49 against rope tin to do a uh, nehru commemorative volume which he finds and he keeps telling all the contributors that look it's not going anywhere i know it will not work but please write and roy says i'll write only on the condition if i'm paid which i think agge tries to get him but he says i can't write on nehru and roy says although and then he writes some wishy washy piece on humanism <clears throat> and uh, that's uh, that uh, and their uh, relationship and uh, mn roy by then and ellen roy both uh, uh, mn and ellen had a very worried about him post 40s we find uh, he he is constantly telling him that you are a chronic depression uh, depression you are always you have some problem or the other you keep too much inside yourself and we find the relationship taken with, with the way they the love for animals plants everything we uh, uh, they they're sharing both and he spends lot more time in dehradun attending uh, this uh, what was called the radical humanist camps and uh, you know when and he's uh, through both of them in fact ellen he says i'm afraid you keep too much to yourself and even inside yourself that often puts one in blues um, you ought to be less esoteric i'm also sort of a recluse but once in a year i go out in the wide world there are some people worth the trouble but let me uh, let me not sermonize uh, so this relationship we find uh, agge uh, uh, agge has now by, by then moved he's also jobless uh, the second world war that's another thing lot of people say about agge that he joined british army so that he could get something out of the government he got nothing he had a contract job with all india radio which didn't work out and post although despite being close to uh, nehru he didn't get any job he's again starting a new venture for which mn roy and others help M N Roy, in fact, ropes him to write a history of humanism in Hindi, uh, which never happened. But like many of this version uh, thing, uh, <clears throat> Ellen also, and this personal uh, thing, uh, they're very interested in Agge's personal life. Also, Agge is seeking a lot of help. His first marriage had broken, uh, and then he was marrying his first wife's niece, which was a scandal of Delhi and Allahabad, and which was Kapilabad sign. on that a crucial role and and kapila's family was uh, not at all uh, in favor of it we find that uh, one of the crucial letters trying to convince kapila's mother was written by ellen roy and uh, this is um, and finally they married they couldn't live in delhi they had to move to allahabad for a brief while but somehow then you know the controversy died and they could move and all that happened uh 51 we find something very good in fact this is something i wanted to ask gautam also that many of the roy camp people when he started this congress for cultural freedom which i was talking about earlier we find they walked into the war. why how did this happen is something i have not been able to unravel everyone nisi musical abu said uh, abu said ayub Sib Narayan Ray, K. K. Sinha, Philip Spratt, everyone walked into this CIA-funded Congress for Cultural Freedom. All the Roy insiders, except for one gentleman from Dehradun who later became editor of uh, Radical Humanist called D. R. Nigam. Everyone, and uh, and Agge, of course, Agge was part. Agge was considered part of the Roy camp. This. Uh, uh, but uh, agge is by then we find his interaction with roy on ideological issues has also come to roy is keeping way unwell one of the last wishes of roy is to go on tirth yatra and pilgrimage which agge found very very strange finally in 52 when he had the paralytic stroke we first person to inform nehru was agge he writes to him about nandilal bos in calcutta and uh, agge and mn roy Finally, uh, Nehru visits them. Nehru visits Roy, uh, where the famous uh, conversation was mostly about plants. Because Nehru saw Roy's house and told Ellen Roy, "How come you have so many plants which I don't have in the Murthy house?" Later, a lot of plants get sent, and she welcomes him actually with 37 varieties of hibiscus and a pot of honey. And Kapila was also there, 
and this was all done by and he says uh, kapila played a big role in this and they were still married then agya and kapila uh, uh one of the last speech that emendra i wanted to be read out was arimpal who is a close associate of uh emend roy had asked him to write uh, for on why communism was dangerous for india again like many of the commitments again never wrote that piece he only kept saying why communism is dangerous for uh, dangerous for india and he he made this uh, kind of a point also because he was persistently attacked by uh, uh, attacked by communist <coughs> and when uh, uh one of the uh, nicest piece one of the most uh, illuminating piece on roy's after she was murdered uh, agay wrote called the roy's of rosenbach uh, where he said that roy's had a perfect partnership in work which was not just a man machine partnership but came after years of understanding between persons a human contact contact which is triumph of that national uh, rational humanity in which both had such abiding faith and uh, so this uh, again this was again who himself called himself a free thinker uh, so we find post emen roy he's got very close to socialist jayaprakash narayan lohia to some extent but mostly jayaprakash narayan and by late 70s early 80s we find uh his kind of moving with uh his his attending bjp inaugural in 1980 attending rss fungi i don't know what roy would have made of it uh but definitely this was uh kind of his long tra trajectory of agay's life but uh, you know uh, even uh, in last one of the last interview that uh, this one gave uh, agay Uh, and he kept talking about how he could have uh, how he could have learned more about from emen roy and how he said after his association with emen roy the close association ended we find the uh, the entire the new uh, you know the two kind of versions of a guess uh, thing about politics in during the second world war he's the one who's telling his lover kripa sen who's telling him not to join army that he says well there are others who only write and don't do anything i have to go even if i'm a writer i have to join war and i have to, i'm i'm in favor of this war because the bigger enemy is fascism but we find uh, by 70s mid 70s he says it's not a writer's job to kind of uh, change the world if my writing changes the world so bad but it's not my job to do it and someone asked him why these two differing opinions in the 40s you said this he says because there's no mn roy to argue with there's no mn roy to argue with he says the only man with whom i lost all arguments but i enjoyed being demolished every time by mn roy so there's no one to argue with so i my world has changed i i don't know who do i go to now to learn and to argue with so this is kind of this is how the life collided interacted and so only politician who again ever ever kind of talked of in great detail was mn roy so that's from my side yeah thank you uh thanks akshay that was really really interesting and many thanks to akshay for um uh, for coming here and presenting on uh agnya it's really a fantastic book highly recommended of course and thanks also to uh, bic tushita and, and in particular to tushita and anand adni for sort of uh, uh, provoking this discussion uh, having uh, you, know, uh, you know seen the uh, piece that i did on emin roy so i'm thankful for them i'm going to show some slides and i'm going to also read sections from my notes so please bear with me so um i want to concentrate on a certain phase of evan roy's political journey which is the seven months that he was at large following his return in december 1930 to india uh covertly and in some sense you know the apogee of his influence during that period uh, arguably is at the karachi 
Congress uh, of the International Co Karachi session of the International Congress uh, between March and uh, end of March and April, early April in 1931. Uh, so Roy was in some sense a very singular figure at that point of time. There was this extraordinary focus by British authorities, um, particularly by British intelligence on his movements and his influence. We see through a large amount of documentation that the colonial authorities maintained, uh, particularly by the Intelligence Bureau, which grew over the 1920s to meet the Bolshevik threat, that Roy is constantly being monitored, his proxies are being looked at, uh, you know, and there uh, are substantial and substantive kind of discussions about how to, uh, how to neutralize the threat. And M. N. Roy, in that sense, seems to symbolize and uh, he becomes a totem of this uh, existential threat for the empire at that point of time. So that's really interesting because, you know, a, a very large amount of documentation was produced. And in fact, over the 1920s, arguably, as some scholars have pointed out, uh, a lot of documentation, internal documentation in the Intelligence Bureau uh, was created to uh, track down the movements of Roy, Bolsheviks, uh, other kinds of malcontents. So, um, moving on, this is a document uh, from the deposition of Sisu K, who is the director of the Intelligence Bureau um, for the uh, Kanpur conspiracy case where Roy was uh, absconding accused. We see uh, right at that early stage, he, in his uh, testimony, we see that he says that towards the end of 1922, and the beginning of 1923, I began to receive certain intercepted original letters, photographs of letters and copies of letters dealing with the Bolshevik propaganda. From original letters, the person who appeared to be controlling the propaganda in India was a man signing himself as M. N. Roy. So uh, Roy enters uh, this phase of colonial documentation, although he was already being tracked from the very point he left India in 1915. And he was on, uh, he was already noticed during his early revolutionary phase as a militant nationalist uh, uh, from 1907 onwards. His itinerant life sort of culminated with him coming back to India. And thereafter, in the seven months that he was at large, traveling uh, to various places, but, uh, meeting national leaders, and also associating with Jawaharlal Nehru, who had great regard for him during that period, uh, Roy became a, a much larger threat because uh, the colonial, the British authorities sensed his presence and uh, came to learn of his uh, flight from Berlin. But also there was another side uh, uh, to the complexity of Roy's presence in India, which I'll come to. So uh, at that point of time, as we see from the newspaper reports, uh, regarding the Karachi Congress. There was a lot of tension which was unfolding. Um, uh, the certain section of the, the Congress, particularly what was seen as the left wing of the Congress with Nehru being uh, the leader in, that se in one sense of th that faction was not particularly uh, aligned with Gandhi's uh, actions during that period, particularly the signing of the Gandhi Irvin Pact or the Delhi Pact as it's known. So before I uh, get to this, I'd like to give a very brief, biogra uh, a short biographical sketch of M. N. Roy um, before we move ahead. So he was born uh, in 18, uh, on 21st March 1887 and he studied Sanskrit under the tutelage of his father who died in uh, 1905. But in 1901, he came under the influence of someone known as Shivnarayan Swami, uh, said to be a fugitive of the 1857 revolt, who was on a mission to train young men, quote, for the resurrection of Hindu society, unquote. But Narain's quest, as he was known then, he was known as, uh, his original name was Narendranath Bhattacharya, or Narain, as he was known, was less spiritual and more material. And he was destined to become a twice-born heretic as his biographer, Samarin Roy, uh, describes him. 
And then he, uh, after the partition of Bengal and the idealism of Bankim Chandra and Swami Vivekananda, he sort of uh, came under the influence and was uh, inspired by Surendranath Banerjee, the former English professor and pioneering nationalist leader. And he then joined Anushilan Samiti. So we have a couple of slides here, which are from intelligence documentation during that period, which show um, um, the first one is the Anushilan Samiti uh, declared unlawful in 1988. And there's a list in documentation of the kinds of events that unfolded over the next six, uh, eight years. And each of these events were very meticulously noted and described uh, in documentation. So I've picked out one particular uh, bit which shows some of the events of Bengal and you'll see a lot of political decoities on the list. M. N. Roy was associated during this period with a lot of these decoities and he was arrested for the first time in I think uh, 1910 in the Howrah conspiracy, if I'm, yes, in the Howrah conspiracy, I think. And, um, and then he, uh, during that period, the Germans were aligned strategically with uh, uh, the Bengal revolutionaries. And we see evidence of uh, these kinds of associations in documentation as well. So here there's a home department telegram on the connections between Bengali uh, revolutionaries and the Germans. And um, there was movement of people, of money, and uh, you know, of uh, plots to import arms, which some were thwarted and some were successful. And M. N. Roy becomes part of this uh, network. And this uh, is um, perhaps one of the most important uh, elements of or, uh, 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 punctuation marks of his life, of his political journey, where he leaves India for the first time in 1915 on a mission to uh, import arms, on a mission to smuggle arms for the uh, revolutionaries of Bengal. He came into contact with the German consul general in November 1914, um, who had recommended that his government seek to covertly collaborate with the revolutionaries in order to undermine the British. So on 12th February 1915, Narain, as he was known then, conducted the audacious Garden Reach decoity and was arrested. And after having granted bail, he then left. Uh, in a plot to import arms, he traveled first to Batavia, which is Jakarta. And um, it, that plot was thwarted. He came back and he left again in August. And on the uh, inspiration of his friend and associate, Jatin Mukherjee, and here's an early home uh, department description of M. N. Roy um, during this period when he was plotting to import arms. So at this point, he, uh, on this, his second attempt, he leaves and he leaves India f for a very long period and he would only come back 16 years later. So he travels firstly to San Francisco under the false identity of Reverend Charles Martin. And there's a home department assessment here of, you know, uh, his, the movement of money at this point of time. And so there he comes, uh, as soon as he lands, he spots a newspaper headline, which says mysterious al alien reaches America, famous Brahmin revolutionary or dangerous German spy. The next day he moves to Palo Alto and there he meets his, uh, um, there he meets Evelyn Trent, who soon become his, uh, they fall in love and he becomes, uh, they, they get married and they move to New York. In New York, in the short stint that he was there, he gets embroiled and is arrested in the Hindu German, German, uh, the, sorry, the German Hindu, and he makes bail and following bail, the couple flee to Mexico City. It's in Mexico City, another, punctuation, inflection point in his life, where he meets a uh, Comintern commissary. Comintern, of, uh, of course, is the abbreviated form of co the Communist International that came to form during this period to advocate and to 
you know, spread communism across the world. So Roy, on the invitation and under the influence of uh, Mikhail Barodin, helps establish the Communist Party of Mexico with, quote, six members and a calico cat, unquote, as described by Carlton Beals, an American journalist and associate of Roy there. During this period, Roy's ascendancy uh, in, the, uh, in the communist establishment is rapid. He attends the Second World Congress of Comintern, and there he presents a thesis which came to be known as the Roy Lenin Debates on the colonial question, which became very central to Comintern's agenda because India became a great focus uh, for Comintern and for Moscow. He became the point man for Lenin's plans, although Virendra Chattopadhyay, another revolutionary whose revolutionary life goes back to the India House period in 1908 uh, in London, was also vying for Moscow's attention during this period. On 17th October 1920, on 17th October 1920, uh, in Tashkent, Roy helps establish the Communist Party of India along with Abani Mukherjee, MPT Acharya, his wife Evelyn Trent and some others. And soon after, a military training school was founded uh, by him there to train revolutionaries. With finances from Comintern, Roy establishes a network of associates in India, which include Sripat Amrit Dange in Bombay, Muzaffar Ahmed in Calcutta, Singer Velu Chettiar in Madras, Ghulam Hussain in Lucknow, and Shaukat Usmani in the United Provinces. Very soon, Roy gets elected to most of the decision-making bodies of Comintern, and his uh, career, international, career as an international communist is uh, Peaks in 1926, where he uh, assumes most of the high offices, and by the end of the year, he becomes a member of all the co important Comintern divisions. But Roy falls out with Comintern in 1928, in part due to the what is described as the Chinese debacle of 1927, when the right-wing faction of the National Nationalist Kuomintang Party, sorry, uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek orchestrated a coup against the Chinese Communist Party that they were in alliance with, thereby betraying the understanding that they had with the Russians. This is an image of uh, Roy's mentor, Mikhail Borodin in Wuhan on that trip in 1927. Roy and his mentor, Borodin, were blamed for that debacle. After a period of intense debates and isolation in 1928, where Roy, and this is again a very interesting inflection point, because Roy begins to d disagree openly against the Stalinist line, and thereby these differences uh, in how India is to be regarded by international communism and by the decision makers in Moscow begins to emerge, and Roy becomes the, uh, the focal point of this disagreement. So, uh, of course, this is aided by in, uh, internal political factionalism con uh, because of Stalin and his loyalists. They sought to discredit uh, many of the people, of course, Trotsky being one, of course. Um, all this forced Roy's secret escape from Moscow, and he was formally expelled by the Comintern in 1929. Over 1929 and 1930, Roy was, quote, this is uh, his biographer Sib Narayan uh, Rai's uh, description, which I'll read out to you. Quote, Roy was hunted by the British intelligence service, maligned and under attack by the Comintern apparatchiki and by party line communists in Germany, England, and India, moving from place to place to avoid arrest and extradition, considerably handicapped by illness and lack of regular income, unquote. This is an image of Roy, a very poor image of Roy and his uh, then romantic partner, Louise Geisler, who very uh, intriguingly and incidentally was the companion for uh, uh, Kamla Nehru uh, at her deathbed in 1936 uh, in Europe. And this is an uh, image from the Foreign Office of a restriction on Louise Geisler's visas when she, in 1931, traveled to India against Roy's wishes to meet him, and she was caught and she was uh, de uh, deported at that point. 
much time. Louise Geisler also accompanied Roy to China on that important trip with Baro Mikhail Borodin and others. This is a very interesting telegram on 29th March 1931, which is um, sent from the Commissioner of Police in, in Karachi to the government of Bombay, which, has, uh, which is a short uh, so a summary of what is happening in, uh, uh, in Karachi at that point. It mentions here that um, Bose appears to have been completely won over by Gandhi, this him meaning Gandhi. Chattopadhyay will probably head any opposition there is. This is a reference to Virendranath Chattopadhyay, of course. There are some signs of split between local extremists and those from outside, meaning uh, revolutionaries based outside of India. And there are suspicions that Roy and other revolutionaries are in Karachi, but none of them have yet been identified. So uh, British intelligence uh, noted rumors of Roy's presence. Uh, he had traveled there under the alias of Dr. Mahmood. And uh, prior to his arrival in Karachi, he had traveled across the United Provinces with Jawaharlal Nehru on the invitation of Jawaharlal Nehru um, on a trip to uh, study the agrarian crisis of, of the region. As Roy wrote in a letter, uh, of course, you know, I must mention here that Roy, uh, Nehru admired Roy's intellectualism as he did Virendranath Chattopadhyay's charisma and revolutionary fervor. As Roy wrote in a letter to his former lover, Louise Geisler, whose image, whose picture we saw earlier, he was, quote, a semi-official guest of the Congress bosses, unquote. So the tensions that were playing out during this period um, animated itself in many ways with different sorts of um, stakeholders. Bose uh, was not, of course, was very unhappy about the uh, Gandhi of impact. And uh, he was quoted uh, as he, uh, he, when he was addressing the uh, Naujawan Bharat Sabha, he was quoted as saying that it was a betrayal of India's struggle for freedom. There's a interesting uh, intelligence uh, Bureau assessment here. Let's try and see if I can point to, yes, the Revolutionary Movement and Congress. It is too early. Uh, this is from a series of documentations of periodic reports during that period, which became, uh, became uh, a part of Intelligence uh, Bureau uh, reports. Uh, they published uh, things called the weekly reports of, uh, by the Director of Criminal Intelligence and fortnightly reports of, uh, by the DCI and political reports of events across the different uh, country. And these periodic reports kept their eyes on revolutionaries both inside India and outside of India as well, through networks, of course. Uh, it is too early yet to gauge the effect of decisions made on Karachi on the revolutionary movement. While it is true that Subhash Chandra Bose came under Ms. Gandhi's spell and has promised to restrain revolutionaries until uh, Gandhi fails to deliver the goods, yet it must be remembered that Bose has no claim to be regarded as the leader of uh, all revolutionary parties in India. The uh, executions during this uh, period, of course, the uh, executions of uh, Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, some days before the Karachi session, inflamed passions further. And um, this was seen, uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, Gandhi Irvin Pact or the Delhi Pact was seen as a con un undue con uh, concessions by Gandhi. There was a sense that Nehru and Bose may block the ratification of the Delhi Pact. And as the scholar J.P. Haithcock says, which is a very interesting assessment of uh, Roy's presence there, secret presence, which has yet to be detected. Roy would have been well aware of his limited influence at the proceedings, but his intention was, quote, simply to magnify the voice of radical dissent and to ensure that an alternative to Gandhi's proposals would be placed clearly before the delegates. Roy wanted to exploit the differences of the Congress to his advantage for a larger intention which was, of course, infiltrating and capturing the Congress. 
uh, with his group, the Royce, as they were known, as they had done in Bombay and across India with uh, the trade unions and the AITUC. They had, the Royce had gained control in the short period that Roy uh, was active in Bombay. Of course, you know, he had sent uh, emissaries and his uh, associates ahead to prepare the groundwork for this. And Roy had argued that through the bourgeois nationalist movement, the path to communist India was through the bourgeois nationalist movement. And he therefore felt that they had to work with the INC, the Indian National Congress, youth organizations and volunteer groups. This was the core of his disagreement with Comintern. And Roy urged Indian communists who still aligned with the official CPI, the Communist Party of India, to reject the Comintern Stalinist line and to throw in their lot with him. Oops, excuse me. So again, this is a assessment from the Intelligence Bureau. Roy arrived with some emissaries. Uh, 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 sorry, Roy sent some emissaries in the summer of 1930 in advance to prepare the ground groundwork for him. So in anticipation, he had dispatched three of, uh, several of his associates, four of his associates, of whom Sundar Kabadi and Tayyab Sheikh reached India between June and August 1930, followed by Brajesh Singh and Dr. Anadi Bhaduri. Sheikh and Kabadi in particular would become Roy's core operatives during this phase. And they carried with them a manifesto titled The Revolutionary Vanguard of the Toy Toiling Masses of India, in which Roy made clear his disagreement with the policy of the official Communist Party, which in his view had been drifting further and further away from the ideals of Lenin. Importantly, the Communist Party cannot advocate that India will immediately be a Soviet Republic. This is, uh, during the same period, another assessment. Have, having secured a substantial footing, Roy turned his attention elsewhere, and the month of 1931 saw him, of course, touring the United Provinces at Jawaharlal Nehru's invitation. And it is of no small importance that the Declaration of Fundamental Rights, of which the Karachi Congress approved at Nehru's instance, is in many respects the minimum program which Roy had advocated in Bombay a few weeks previously. I'll come to this uh, shortly. So the oral history account of one of his associates, which is Sundar Kabadi, is really quite interesting. Sundar Kabadi described himself as a pure and simple nationalist congressman. But, uh, and he was a student in Berlin at that time. And he came under the influence of uh, Roy's associates, uh, particularly Tayyab Sheikh. As Kabadi says, Roy's identity was accidentally revealed to him by Tayyab Sheikh in Berlin. Roy was furious, but he used this as an opportunity to rope in uh, Kabadi. And Kabadi traveled in June 1930. His trip was paid by Brajesh Singh, who was of the Kalakankar royal family, and eventually, of course, he married uh, Stalin's daughter, Svetlana. And British authorities had information that Roy may be in India, and they had uh, uh, received inputs, intelligence inputs from Europe, that he had left Berlin. Consequently, Kabadi was under watch. Roy and his group traveled uh, to Karachi secretly, and Tayyab Sheikh and Sundar Kabadi acted as front men, and who presented Roy's uh, ideas at sessions and gave interviews and spoke on his behalf and met national leaders on his behalf. Importantly, Kabadi claims that the resolution on fundamental rights that Nehru presented at Karachi was written by Roy. We see that here. Nehru came out because Roy had told him that I would come. That's uh, Sundar Kabadi speaking. Then I told Nehru, Banerjee, which is Roy Elias that he was using there, was here and wanted to know where he was going to stay. Nehru said, wait, Kabadi, I will come back. He went in and came back with a slip of paper. Nehru had arranged for his accommodation in one of the Congress huts. I went to Roy. Every evening, he, he was meeting Nehru. You know that Karachi Congress drafted the, uh, the fundamental rights resolution. The interviewer, Nanda says, Vyad Nanda says, yes. Kabadi says, who drafted it? I would like to know. It was Roy. I was the typist, and Roy was the draftsman. This, of course, the drafting of this, uh, uh, this resolution on fundamental rights is highly contested by, by in different quarters. The authorship 
of it, was, uh, as I mentioned, is under contention, was a matter of contention. Many believe Roy was the author, but British intelligence amplified uh, this rumor or the speculation that Roy, M. N. Roy was the author of the, fun, uh, the resolution on fundamental rights. And Nehru was forced to issue a statement denying the role of, quote, a certain mysterious individual with communist affiliations, unquote. Nehru would later write uh, that uh, in his biography that all suggestions of Roy's influence on the draft were a creation of the British establishment. It was noted by British intelligence that Gandhi was also aware of Roy's presence. Interestingly, Kabadi reveals that Nehru asked Roy, and going back to your discussion on uh, the differences between Roy and uh, Gandhi, Kabadi reveals that Nehru asked Roy if he would meet Gandhi during the Karachi Congress, and Roy refused saying that if Gandhi was asked by a policeman if he had met Roy, Gandhi being the satyagrahi that he is, would have been forced to speak the truth. Importantly, Kabadi also claims that the presence of Roy in India was leaked to the authorities by the official Communist Party of India. As Kabadi says, police came to know Roy through the Communist Party, of Roy's presence through the Communist Party. The Communist Party gave help to the police as manifestos were prepared by Roy. I was not able to write such Marxist manifestos. My name was put there, but the style was Roy's. The smart communists suspected that. They started an agitation that Roy was in India and British imperialism was keeping him in India. So the police started searching for him. Everyone was followed by the police. Uh, this is uh, headlines during that period of how uh, Gandhi's line, of course, triumphed eventually and um, a cutout section there of the fundamental rights of uh, citizens defined uh, during this period. This is uh, um, published much later, of course, August 7th, 1931. These are a few of the Roy's. M. N. Roy is seen here with V. B. Karnik, who was a student leader during that period in Bombay and eventually became like a, a trade union activist and a lawyer. And Mani Benkara, who was a Royist, uh, who was part of the early Royce groups. As the then student leader Royst and later trade union leader and lawyer Karnik reveals, Kabadi had arranged for M. N. Roy's accommodation with a theosophist family when he first arrived in Bombay uh, as Dr. Mehmood. This is in uh, Juhu. The Bombay group of followers first met Roy at Sundar Kabadi's place in Gavalia tank in central Mumbai. He adds that the activities of Sheikh and Kabadi roused suspicion uh, in the police and intelligence was also received, of course, from German sources that Roy had left Berlin. While in Bombay, Roy's associates arranged meetings for him with various uh, leaders. And as Karnik says, he met Sardar Patel, Bhulabai Desai, B. R. Ambedkar, and N. N. Joshi. And it is more than likely that the official Communist Party of India was the source of information for British intelligence during this period of Roy's presence given, of course, the deep animosity uh, between the uh, CPI, the official CPI, and, uh, and Moscow, and Roy. In fact, this opens up a very interesting uh, line of tension between these uh, various groups. This is um, an Intelligence Bureau, Bureau assessment of the Comintern's intentions and line towards India and a published document which was brought and then revised for Indian purposes was first titled the draft platform of action for India. And we will see here that, you know, one of the problematic uh, things which was also somewhat which appears in the uh, in the resolution of fundamental rights at the Karachi Congress was the confiscation and nationalization of all British factories, of course, in a more extreme form in the Comintern uh, document, banks, railways, sea and river transport and plantations. So in during this period, apprehending a threat, the Comintern decided to uh, increase scrutiny and send agents to India in order to counter Roy's threat because they saw 
uh, Roy not just as a larger threat to the communist movement overall, but in particular, they saw him as creating divisions within the communist, official co communist party of India and drawing away its official members. So uh, one of the uh, two agents were first sent by Comintern, which is the intelligence bureau made a note of, and someone posing a William Nathan Quaid posing as an antiquarian and ha uh, Harry Somers in July of 1930, who posed as a representative of the cellulose company. They were well supplied, importantly, they were well supplied with funds and their arrival coincided with the publication of certain illicit news sheets by the Deshpande group. Deshpande refers to SV Deshpande of the Communist Party, official Communist Party of India. One evening in February 1931, a young officer of the foreign branch of the Bombay police, Richard Keith Hampton, took his wife out to dinner at a fancy hotel. The manager gave them a specially requested seat that allowed Hampton the view of an American couple, the Lynns. Some days back, Hampton had received a call from a British man working at the travel firm American Express. He was suspicious of the Lynns. The special branch already knew that the uh, American importer of skin, skins, sorry, Henry G. Lind and his wife had arrived in Bombay as tourists. This was February 1931. Soon Lind rented uh, a flat near Gwalior Palace and hired an office on Hornby Road. Hampton learned soon from a peon working in the adjoining office that Lind was purchasing snake and iguana skins. During this period, the Intelligence Bureau had received information of the split uh, in the Indian communists and that an agent had been sent to fix things. Hampton put two and two together on a hunch and following telegraph exchanges with Delhi, he was tasked with getting a precise description of Lind. The Linds were placed under 24 hour surveillance. Roy's influence in the few months that he had been in India was nothing short of remarkable and greatly troubling, of course, for the common turn. They were concerned that the influence, uh, that uh, he would influence the official CPI members and consequently Lind was sent. This man, as the director of the Intelligence Bureau, Horace Williamson would say, would later write in an, uh, in, uh, an assessment in 1933, quote, Lin's mission to India was clearly to apportion the blame for the official party's breakdown, to remedy whatever defects he found, and to fight the influence of M.N. Roy's party. Lind, uh, Richard Keith Hampton, the officer of the foreign branch, eventually tracked them down after much deliberation uh, and communications with uh, Delhi. They were arrested and he personally escorted them to a ship and deported them. And uh, Lind was said to have uh, uh, disappeared, uh, disembarked somewhere, and uh, then traveled onwards to Moscow to file a report. This information, very interestingly, is published in uh, an account of Richard Hampton Keith, which is um, published, which was published um, uh, in the last 15 years, I think, by BPRD, uh, the Police Research Development uh, Publishing Wing. During this period of uh, turmoil and changing fortunes, the, uh, the Royce managed to gain a lot of traction and seize control of the Indian trade unions, much to the alarm of uh, 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 Moscow. There's another very interesting component and uh, to, this, uh, to the tracking of M.N. Roy in Bombay, and that is to do with Suhasini Nambiar. Suhasini Nambiar was the estranged wife of ACN Nambiar, a journalist uh, and an anti-colonial activist in Berlin. She was, Suhasini Nambiar was also the second last sibling of uh, Sarojini Naidu. And she's said to be the first com woman communist member, uh, first member of the Communist Party of India, woman member. With her is a man called Hester Lachin, uh, Lester Hutchinson, sorry. Lester Hutchinson, who was a sort of unaffiliated uh, communist activist, although his mother was an official member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. And he traveled with Suhasini Nambiar in uh, September of 1928 to Bombay. This image uh, is part of the surveillance files on uh, Suhasini Nambiar that was acquired uh, by the author 
of the biography of A.C. and Nambiar, Mr. Vapala Balchandran, from the Bombay Special Branch Archives. And the, those archives in particular and that documentation provide extensive details of the tracking of Suhasini Nambiar and other communist activists in Bombay. But this is directly related, her presence is directly related to uh, the tracking of M.N. Roy because not only was Suhasini Nambiar and her sister Rinalni Chattopadhyay, who was living in Khar at that time, um, they were being tracked because documents, uh, papers and letters and money were sent to their addresses by Roy and uh, members of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, and so they, they were under surveillance. They were, she was also under surveillance, of course, because she happened to be the uh, sister of Virendra Chattopadhyay, a much hunted man. And that's Binalini Chattopadhyay, that is someone called Mrs. Rajam. And this, is, uh, this image is taken at the Khar uh, uh, residence of Minali Chattopadhyay. And that's an image of Asian Nambiar and Suhasini Nambiar in Berlin. Suhasini Nambiar had returned from Berlin with uh, Hugh Lester Hutchinson, who went on to become, uh, after his incarceration in the Merit Conspiracy case, he went on to become uh, a Labour MP in Britain. He had uh, no, uh, uh, Lester Hutchinson had no clear links with the CPGB, uh, the Communist Party of Great Britain. But he was very well acquainted with Roy and he was in contact with Viren Nachatupa there prior to his uh, arrival in Bombay with Suhasni. Um, in fact, um, later in an interview, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay uh, mentions that Suhasni Nambiar and uh, a sort of urban legend, I, I suppose, you know, a legend of her uh, of, uh, regarding Suhasni was sort of per uh, perpetrated uh, because of that interview that Suhasni Nambiar had fled Germany in, uh, during the Nazi regime in 1933 and he, she traveled back to India as a stowaway on a ship. But uh, as we know from colonial documentation and from the surveillance file, their arrival in Bombay was noted very precisely and their movements were tracked until, of course, you know, um, Lester Hutchinson was arrested during the Meerut conspiracy case in March of 1929. And Suhasni uh, then would visit Lester Hutchinson when, during his incarceration. The Worker and Peasants Party, which was set up in uh, uh, Bombay as a legal front for the illegal communist party, on the instructions of M.N. Roy became quite influential during 1927 to 29 period. And of course, uh, uh, this sort of uh, came to an end partially with the uh, 31 members of uh, communist members being arrested in the Merit Conspiracy case. By then, members of uh, the Communist Party and members of Roy's party as well, uh, affiliated with Roy under Roy's instructions, had made inroads in other cities and other unions from textile workers in Sholapur and Kanpur, iron and steel workers in Jamshedpur, jute workers in Bengal, and railway workers across the country. The British communist agents, Philip Spratt and Benjamin Bradley, who were also arrested in the Merit Conspiracy case, were quite influential and were elected to office in major trade unions. British intelligence assessed this widespread reach as, quote, by the end of 1928, there was hardly a single public service uh, utility service or industry that remained, which was not affected in whole or in part by the wave of communism which swept, swept the country during that period. Uh, sorry, uh, just going back a little bit. Suhasni Nambiar, although she addressed the Bharat Naujavan uh, Sabha uh, in 1929 at Lahore, she was unable to do, attend it in 1931, so she sent a message. And interestingly, we will see at the bottom, he says, hope they will uh, regret inability to attend the uh, congratulate Naujawans on their valiant role at Karachi. Hope they will not be duped by the phrase mongerings of the alleged left wing in the Congress. That is a direct reference to M.N. Roy. So in, the, uh, in these uh, complex mix of cross loyalties and conflicting interests, Suhasni uh, uh, Chattopadhyay um, was also um, being tracked for another reason, 
uh, sorry, another member of the family was being tracked, which was her brother, her sibling, Harindranath Chattopadhyay, a playwright and a poet who was upcoming at that uh, time. British intelligence, um, this is a list of undesirables, uh, uh, intelligence uh, bureau uh, list of undesirables, uh, many familiar names we will see there. Henry Pollitt was the uh, uh, um, general secretary of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Saklatwala, Shapoji Saklatwala. And of course, there's uh, who was uh, um, a Labour MP, who was also a communist and a member of the CPGB. There is also M. N. Roy, Virendranath Chattopadhyay, A. C. N. Nambiar, and many others. I will also point here to um, another document of the Intelligence Bureau during that period, which refers to the militant section of the communists. There is also an extreme anarchical section wedded to violence represented by Mrs. Nambiar, A. Sheikh and others, which is working alone and has so far taken no part in discussions with the Congress. These, the previous document in this, Suhasini Nambiar's mention there, indicates the differences between the two factions in the Communist Party. In fact, perhaps arguably there were three different uh, factions. Those who were caught in the middle, people like S.V. Deshpande of the official party, uh, Communist Party of India, the militant section that were aligned with Comintern and the hard line and the hard Stalinist line, and M. N. Roy and the, those who desired to be communists and, but desired to align with the nationalists in their strategic uh, program. So these are the merit arrestees. I, I don't think this is working. Maybe the battery has died or something like that. I want to move on to the next slide? Right. That's Harindranath Chattopadhyay. As we can see there, you know, uh, British intelligence is, uh, very uh, intriguingly describes him as a good for nothing sort of man who is not capable of doing us very much harm. Uh, I share Mr. Clary's view of Harindranath Chattopadhyay, who in my uh, estimation is a poor sort of creature altogether. Harindranath Chattopadhyay was also uh, commonly and frequently seen at V.B. Karnik's flat in Lamington Road, where the Roy's gathered and there was a, a V.B. Karnik ran an association of uh, youth leaders and students called the Bombay Youth League. And there several gatherings used to happen and in Roy's uh, initial days, he appeared at uh, this place where meetings used to happen as Dr. Mahmood without the then many of the Roy's ex uh, except for Tayyab Sheikh and Sundar Kabadi realizing the identity of women Roy during that period. An interception order, uh, despite this uh, uh, description, an uh, interception order was in place to track Harindranath Chattopadhyay's communications as well. At that, at one particular evening at uh, V.B. Karnik's flat, Harin was, Harin was in attendance and greeted Roy there like a long lost brother. Roy, as Karnik says in his account, quote, dropped a hint that that chance meeting might not end well, unquote. The group learned that Harin lost no time in informing his sister Suhasni that Roy was in town disguised as Dr. Mahmood. And a few days later, Harin told Karnik that the doctor was actually M. N. Roy and he ought not to associate with that dangerous type of person. Next slide, please. This is an image of Hanuman Terrace on Lamington Road. Uh, this image, a uh, photograph that I took in two, uh, 2015. Uh, on the third floor was V.B. Karnik's flat. Next slide. Thereafter, it was impossible uh, for Roy to move about uh, with the relative freedom that he had, uh, dis despite the sur surveillance of all, um, people around him, he still was able to move about. Um, this was curtailed further because of this um, revelation by Harindranath Chattopadhyay. A few days later, after this incident at Karnik's flat, Roy left for the United Provinces under the uh, shelter of Brajesh Singh, 
the royal of uh, Kalakantkar family. And uh, they traveled together with Sundar Kabadi and Tayyab Sheb to, uh, to Karachi. Next. Uh, the previous, sorry, the previous slide. Go back. The previous one before this. Sorry, the next one. Yeah. So this is how Roy would eventually end up at the Karachi Congress, attending sessions in disguise and leaving his mark covertly on a foundational aspect of modern India's constitution. At no time, however, was he not under scrutiny since the day he left in 1915. My purpose in this talk was to present a set of circumstances and anecdotes that all center around one fact, that M. N. Roy was, a, was sent, the center of extraordinary focus by the British intelligence. I have not gone into the role played by uh, another controversial officer of the Bombay uh, Special Branch, uh, whose name, who was of Russian descent, whose name is Boris De Derejitsky, who was allegedly, who allegedly planted evidence in the Merit conspiracy case uh, to entrap uh, against Benjamin Bradley and others. I've also not looked at the controversy surrounding something called the Assembly Letter, which is also thought to be a fabrication of British intelligence in the case against M. N. Roy. Roy was, uh, when he was eventually tried, um, the assembly letter was, uh, uh, Roy argued was, uh, and his Roy's defense argued was a fabrication. But uh, the, the prosecution was able to successfully counter that. Despite, uh, you know, there were uh, many other details which point to a profound uh, role that British intelligence played in thwarting the efforts of Roy. In fact, all the way back to 1922, uh, there is a case of uh, which caused great embarrassment for the British authorities and for the Home Department in Bombay, the case of a Comintern emissary called Charles Ashley, who, uh, although he was detected earlier on, uh, his arrival to India, to Bombay was detected, he was allowed to disembark and uh, in Bombay, and he secretly met, of all people, Marmaduke Pixall, who was the editor of uh, the Bombay Chronicle at that period, a Khilafatist and uh, uh, anti-colonial activist in his own right. So the, the point uh, in mentioning that is to show that there is a very steady graph trajectory of the attention that British intelligence focus on Roy. And Roy becomes central to uh, the perception of threat by the colonial authorities. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they, they saw him as emblematic of uh, an existential threat. In the, uh, on July 22nd, 1931, there is uh, the article of his arrest from the Bromwick Chron uh, Chronicle. He was, uh, Roy was arrested by another celebrated uh, figure of the Bombay police, uh, Kawasji Petigara, in a dramatic secret operation. Emenroy was a unique and complex figure, and this dramatic phase of his life, prior to his life, um, coming back to India, going, traveling across UP, uh, United Provinces, aligning with the nationalists, influencing the trade union movement, and leaving his mark through uh, the draft of the, the resolution of the fundamental rights, uh, points to you know, uh, a sense of uh, influence that does not uh, is not generally known. But Roy did, during this phase, interesting phase, leave his mark. Thank you very much. Are there observations in that unpublished piece on him? What do you thought about that? Uh, he was kind of, see, he was uh, barely 18, 19 when he went to jail. And he had gone through the, he was a revolutionary and he was, so he had his questions that, all the questions that revolutionaries had about Gandhian method, Gandhian politics. But we find, and, and uh, this continues. So he's debating a lot with uh, someone like Janendra Kumar, who's trying to convince him that you have to relook to Gandhi, read more on Gandhi in jail. And he says that I'm trying. And, and, and you find this long correspondence happening. So I find uh, what could have happened, what he would have, uh, kind of not been so harsh as he was the early days when he was in jail. He was, he's angry about Gandhi.
but subsequently we find when he's out of jail and when this Gandhi issue of Bisal Bharat is to come out, see Aram Saran Gup tells him that, you know, he's noticing change in um, Bisal Bharat and he's asking who the editor is. So he's aware of your presence. By 40s, we find, late, mid 40s, uh, he says that he changed his opinion on Gandhi. He says that, um, you know, that only Gandhi could have done this. It was not easy for uh, someone to have so many differing opinions, take them along. So his opinion has changed, but he largely remains a kind of, he's more of a Nehruvian. Nehru is also his personal hero in many ways. Yeah. Around 1915-16, when you say M. N. Roy was trying to gather arms, etc., and he went to Indonesia, did he interact with uh, Rash Bihari Bose in Japan, who was also trying to gather arms? Any evidence of that? Yeah, he did uh, travel to Japan. I mean, there is. Uh, I haven't looked at documentation of that period uh, in specific with his travels across the Far East before he landed up in San Francisco. So yes, but uh, I think he did. Uh, 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 encounter Raj Bihari Bose in that period, but I can't say that for a certainty. What we do know is that um, the it was a it was a German sponsored plot, and then uh, it got complicated due to the movement of ships and you know his his sort of trying to escape um, uh, being tracked. So he there was a there was quite a long period before he arrived in San Francisco in 1916. So at least a six month period, he was traveling across the Far East. Was there any between Much later, yes. No. No. Um, much later uh, in the 40s, there is some, there was a meeting between Roy and Savakar and Roy expressed his admiration for Savakar's revolutionary spirit. And there were the speculations of other kinds of things. But that's, uh, that's quite uh, interesting to look at in the future um, for uh, different reasons. But Roy was not, um, I mean, it's, Roy was certainly not, um, driven any more due to due to the changes his uh, the changes of political thought uh, in his early phase in Mes mexico had roy had quite significantly moved away from um, the idea of militant nationalism which was the phase uh, of the india house period for savakar and many of the associates even for virendra nath chattopadhyay in fact we know that virend chato moved away from that and he flirted with uh, anarchism for a while in Europe. And then, of course, he um, you know, became a Bolshevik. And he went to Mo Moscow and was purged by Stalin eventually. So you know, it's, it's an interesting question what their association was. It was a brief association, but much, much later, in the 40s. Do you see any revival of what's related to Roy after the One can only hope so. Uh, writer after Prem Chand. So what made you write this book? Is it because of him being a writer or because of his politics? Uh, both as well as a fascinating life. Uh, he, he is completely different from his entire generation of Hindi writers and subsequent generation of Hindi writers. He, as I said, uh, you know, the normally this, what in Hindi we call Kasbai, root of Hindi writers. So he comes, his cosmopolitanism comes from his travels as a child and later. His itinerant in person, which he is famously called Yayavar, uh, Agge. So his life, very few, he, before Agge, if you think of Hindi writers, I, I'm just talking about Hindi writers, uh, we didn't even know about, uh, say, what was happening in there who the partners were. I'm just giving a small information, a small kind of sight to him. Do we know who was Mathali Saran Gupta's wife? Or, who, or Jasankar Prashad? Or, or, you know, this whole generation, the, uh, the dawns of Hindi. You find with him, this modernism is not only in the writing, even in the life. 
so therefore he also gets attacked persistently by the you know the other section of hindi writers who always saw him as an outsider and again i think a year before he died he said that look i i gave my life to this language but they never considered me own now nobody even reviews my books so he remained an outsider despite being integral to all the controversies if we see from 1940s till his death so yeah so nobody had led a life like him maybe the one of mukti both maybe in a very different way but yes but yeah again that way his life was very very <clears throat> both of you have realized very well many of these past stories but i have a question for the future how can india be free from the intellectual and emotional slavery as long as we continue our national anthem janaganamana sorry i didn't understand our national anthem written in 1911 we continue that so as long as we continue that can we be free from intellectual emotional slavery in this country uh, so, yeah <laughs> no i live it it's, uh, it's too far to come and it's beyond me to someone like akar sud i i don't know what the words mean other than punjab singh yeah 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 yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah no absolutely and i i don't even know how that makes us slave anymore or i don't know just because it was written at a certain period the time when we were still under the colonial rule is that a problem i don't know this this is a tough one gautam you want to say so yeah i mean huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> quite possible yeah yeah what was the cause that shifted him from that militant nationalism to communism was i know mexico but then the humanism what was that exact like moment was it stalin or was it the crisis in wuhan with the chinese or which moment exactly yeah i mean i think all the biographies of uh, on roy explore this trajectory and there's been a lot written on emin roy i mean he had many friends and many uh, biographers it's it's a, it's interesting i mean clearly uh, mikhail borodin was a great influence on him the environment in mexico he was a young man you know he was uh, he just left uh, india he got married and you know the, the it's also the personal inward journey which is not merely political right there are political aspects to it and politics of course sort of collide with other kinds of um, trajectories so but i think the fact that um he came under the influence of mikhail borodin and started to look at things on a larger scale and the in the light of the october revolution the russian revolution and of course there was a great uh, interesting circle of intellectuals of artists and others you know so there was a lot going on so that gr- clearly greatly influenced him and in that sense you know he moved away from being someone from a small village in bengal to becoming a intellect- intellectual esthete on a global scale so he changed personally as well you know he be- he started eating meat he started drinking alcohol and you know so th- there were other kinds of changes so i think a lot of young people go through those changes and so he did but the later part of why he um you know started to think about radical humanism and that's i mean perhaps it's part of his uh comes out of his uh disillusionment with uh the established uh, stalinist uh, regime he began thinking in different ways um yeah i mean i i mean i haven't uh, looked specifically uh at that aspect of his uh, political thought in in terms of how why he ch- his motivations for changing 
but he did change quite significantly. And they're really very interesting phases. So my concentration has really been on how uh, the development of colonial intelligence ran in tandem with M. N. Roy's journey uh, and how he became a central focus. And that's borne out by documentation. So that's really um, what I've looked at f far more closely. Thank you so much. Maybe one last question. So what happened to the Royce after him? Sundar Kabadi became a um, journalist, I think, uh, um, for a national newspaper here. And then he was a correspondent in London for a while. So I think like the Royce move. The Royce move? I think so, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, uh, V.B. Karnik, uh, stuck close to Roy till the very end. And Roy, of course, died in, uh, he had a fall in 1952, I think, and died in 1954. And he was unable to go to Bandung. Tarkunde continued, Tarkunde and others. So meeting, uh, in fact, just Ram was telling me, till 80s, uh, meeting will happen in the house, in the Radun house. So there was some, we still, uh, this Nigam that I was talking about, uh, he, many others, they continued, but now it's a complete dilapidated house. Archives have moved all over, but mostly it's in Delhi. Uh, books also, God knows what happened to the huge collection that Roy's had. So its legacy actually ended with Ellen's murder. Yeah. What does Ajay mean? Uh, Ajay means unknowable. Unknowable. What does Ajay mean? Uh, Hiranand, Vatsayan. Ajay was given to him by Prem Chand. Uh, when he was in jail, Premchand published his first story in Jagran. Uh, used to edit a, a paper called Jagran. And so Janendra Kumar had smuggled that story out. Premchand asked, who is the writer? He says, Agge. So he published it as Agge because his name couldn't have gone. So it got stuck and again never liked it. He said, already I have a mouthful of a name. And then you call me a noble. But somehow it kind of got stuck. Uh, thank you. And with that, we come to an end. Uh, thank you, Gautam, and thank you, Akshaya, for being here today.